Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, a local bookstore with a big impact, the ongoing battle against HIV AIDS among New Yorkers of color, and Brick's media share program, and how now is the time for local organizations to apply. Hi, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Ashley Ford, and I'd like to take a break from Trump. Can I? I don't know. It doesn't seem like he'll allow it. It saddens me to think that no other human in the history of humankind will have more ink and air devoted to his name other than maybe Jesus, who I actually think talked less. Jesus. But let's take a break, sort of, and look at something else of import. Remember the Ebola outbreak in 2014? A bit far from your consciousness? That's for a reason. When the outbreak occurred in West Africa, the U.S. was faced with a choice. Retreat, close our borders, and cross our fingers, or be proactive. The Obama administration decided to tackle the crisis head-on, appropriating funds for the Centers for Disease Control, sending health professionals and equipment to the afflicted countries. Now, you can't prove a negative, like what would have happened otherwise. But despite all the panic, there were only two deaths from the disease here in the U.S. And though devastating in Africa, without the CDC intervention, it likely would have been a lot worse. Why do I bring this up? Because under this administration, the CDC seems less poised to act. A few days ago, it was announced that the government will cut by 80% its efforts to combat global outbreaks. The global health security agenda, substantially funded by the U.S. during the fight against Ebola, will run out of money in 2019. And there's fear this administration won't authorize a renewal of funds. Even if they did, there's no guarantee the funds would be administered effectively. Last week, Trump's head of the CDC resigned because of complex financial interests including investments in pharmaceutical companies and big tobacco. But if we don't re-up, other countries might pull back as well. Congress has until February 12th to pass a new budget and include funding for this agenda. But the CDC is already starting to scale back its international operations. Former director of the CDC and former head of New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Thomas Frieden says, we can either help other countries stop disease outbreaks abroad or fight them here at home. I vote for the latter. No, just kidding, I vote for the former. Please don't bring those things to our shores, I'd rather not. On the show today, a conversation with an owner of a local bookstore and how they contribute to democracy, promoting HIV AIDS awareness in the African American community, and BRICS Media Share, helping organizations message their mission. But first, these things. 21 Brooklyn public schools were named best in New York State. Amidst all the hand-wringing about the sorry state of New York City schools, this is welcome news. The schools were noted for achievement in English language and math skills. They called the schools reward schools, and among them are two in District 17, which has one of Brooklyn's most diverse populations, with many recent immigrants. The district also faces competition from many charters and some notoriously low-performing schools. News to me, there's a Coney Island Creek. I definitely didn't know that. But not news to nearby residents, it's still contaminated with poop, according to Brooklyn Daily. I say still because about a year and a half ago, an apartment complex was caught illegally pumping its sewage into the creek. But recent fecal bacteria tests show the dumping must still be pumping. No indication that this has affected Coney Island's swimming beaches, though I might hesitate to return, just a little bit. Personally, do whatever you want. Now, we don't promote cigarette smoking on this show, but we do promote unusual stories, like this one, per vice, which first broke it. A Brooklynite is giving away lightly used cigarettes on Craigslist. When I first heard this, I envisioned some partially smoked smokes. And because it says lightly, figured the filters came lipstick free, but no. It's just that the two packs on offer have been opened and are not full packs. Though the gifter has kindly offered to combine the two into one for ease of delivery. This is what's known in the journalism trade as a puff piece. Stay tuned for our first guest. <laughs> Hey. 
Brick and mortar bookstores have been an endangered species ever since Amazon came on the scene. But one Brooklyn local has demonstrated its worthiness beyond just being a bookseller. They're a pillar of the community, as anyone knows who's traveled up Fulton into Fort Greene, or been to their new branch on Flatbush. It's Greenlight Bookstore, and we have co-owner Jessica Stockton Banula with us today to talk about staying afloat and about Greenlight's role in the borough and beyond. Welcome to 112 BK, Jessica. Thanks for having me. It's so good to have you here. It makes me happy, personally. <laughs> I know. I was saying it's fun to be in your house. We have you in our house quite a bit these days. <laughs> I'm in your house all the time. <laughs> so let's just start. How do you end up opening an independent brick and mortar bookstore in the age of Amazon? Like, how did that even come about? I know it seems kind of crazy, right? A and bit. the year that we opened, it was 2008, 2009. That seemed mm -hmm. like an even crazier time to start any kind of business. But I mean, you could talk about the endangered species thing, but I like to think about maybe independent bookstores are actually like the little furry mammals running around with all the big dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. It seems impossible that anything could compete with those big dinosaurs, but we're not doing the same thing that they're doing. We're doing something totally different. And mm -hmm. Rebecca, my business partner, and I had both worked in independent bookstores and we knew how they could work well. Mm -hmm. And they work well when they're deeply connected to their community and when they're doing everything they can to be a beautiful space that people want to spend time in. Right. Because that's, you know, you don't only buy a book because you want to read it all by yourself. Yourself. Like yeah. books are a thing that people connect about and a bookstore is a place where people make that connection. Absolutely. So tell me about the decision to expand into Flatbush. Yeah. Um, Rebecca lives in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I live in the Fort Greene neighborhood. So it's like we both had a kind of had been putting down roots in these neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. And just like we did when we were opening a store in Fort Greene, we looked at a map and we looked at sort of where the bookstores are. And there's a big part, like sort of the eastern part of Brooklyn, where there weren't any bookstores. There was nothing mm -hmm. there. And we knew there were readers there and authors there. And we knew there was a community that would appreciate having a bookstore there. So we met with some local organizations. Um, we sort of did our research in terms of demographics. We found a good landlord and we opened up in the fall of last year. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm so happy you did because <laughs> yeah. now you're so close we're to neighbors. me. Right. But, you know, one of the things that I was talking to my producer about earlier is the fact that a local bookstore can have the same effect on a community, in my mind, as a local library, mm. in community building. Yeah. How do you shoulder that responsibility? Uh, I feel like we're always trying to do it better. Like, we mm -hmm. never feel like, all right, now we're done. <laughs> We've done everything right. we need to. And I think especially in PLG on Flatbush, like, we're still figuring that out. Some of the things that we learned how to do well in Fort Greene, you'd have to do them a little different because the neighborhood is different. It has its own personality. Like, we found that digital marketing works really well in Fort Greene, doesn't work as well in PLG. We have to mm -hmm. be out there with postcards and flyers. Um, you know, we're connecting all the time with local organizations. Partnerships are a huge part of what we do because mm -hmm. the people who are already there, obviously, are the ones who know how to reach people, right. what people need, you know, where they're coming from. So um, it's not us like trying to reinvent the wheel, it's us like working with the folks who are there and being like, what can we do? What do you need? Where can we go from here? I love that. And I also love that having you guys in the neighborhood has really allowed there to be like these bigger conversations about bigger events, mm -hmm. um, not just in Fort Greene, but also in PLG because, you know, PLG gets the same flies. We know what's going on right. over there too. I brought flies. So Needle. you guys have had, <laughs> I mean, last year you had Ta-Nehisi Coates. Yeah. Um, I think, was it last year or the year before that you had Zadie Smith? We hosted Zadie Smith a couple years back, but yeah. last year we had Jennifer Egan, we had Teju Cole, we right. had, uh, yeah, a bunch of big, great events last and year. And then you had Hillary Clinton. Yes. <laughs> then you had Hillary Clinton. And you didn't have, one of the things that you guys do a lot that I notice is that when you have some of these bigger names, you usually have something at like St. Joseph College right. or something like that yeah. where it can take more people. Yeah. But Hillary Clinton you had in the store <laughs> in Fort Greene, and you okay. had a line going around the block. Yep. You had Secret Service up in there. Mm -hmm. Was that the first time you had Secret Service up in the <laughs> Fort Greene store? Absolutely was. We've never done anything like that before. It was yeah. incredible. But uh, we we made some friends on the Secret Service yeah. team. <laughs> they, you know, and they were they were great to work with. And and she was amazing and gracious and mm -hmm. like you know like chatted with us and like knew about the bookstore and stuff. And we were just like wow. And I mean, and everyone who came to that had this amazing emotional moment with her. It was right. maybe the hardest event we've ever done, but it was totally worth it. You know, we, this is something that I'm thinking about a lot right now um, as it pertains a little bit to what you do and like paying attention to politics and things like that. And Hil the Hillary Clinton thing just put it in my mind. But we had a brick executive on not too long ago to talk about net neutrality. And <laughs> he said that one of the things he's worried about, if he Googled a book, what's going to come up is not Greenlight Bookstore, it's Amazon. So how do you battle that? 
we're working on that. That's interesting. A bunch of our booksellers just came back from a, a big professional conference called Winter Institute. And one of the things we're learning about is like, how do you bump up your results in the mm -hmm. Google search, like search engine optimization? That's something that like a lot of booksellers are thinking about really seriously. But I mean, I, for me, the basic thing is like, we, we have an e-commerce website and that's great. And we do business with that, especially with signed copies. People are coming to us for that. Oh, yeah. But like, essentially like we're not in the online sales game, we're mm -hmm. in the neighborhood game. So like maybe when he does the search, he's not gonna find that book, but he's gonna like see one of our flyers or see one of our posters or chat with a neighbor who's like, I'm going to that event with that person. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna have reasons to come into our store over and over again. And hopefully right. he's gonna pick up a flyer and he's gonna see what's coming up. Yes. Um, so while we're working on like making our digital presence known and like obviously net neutrality is a huge issue for independent businesses specifically mm -hmm. um i don't feel like that's where the core of our business is and the right. core is always going to be like we are humans in a, in a human space interacting with other humans right know? i like that <laughs> i like that i feel like that's the way i do with my life yeah. it's like don't worry don't worry about what you can find about me online <laughs> right. wait until you meet me in person we're just going to keep doing well what we do well and yes. like the people who are looking for that we hope are going to find us so. another thing that i've noticed when i come into bookstores not just yours actually even though i come in yours the most let's be real <laughs> um is that when there's something happening in the national conversation when there's something going on that's part of like a distinct cultural moment mm -hmm. the book tables change and they address that Absolutely. How do you decide like what to put out and when to put it out when it comes to these national conversations? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge collaborative effort and it's something that I think we and many bookstores are thinking about more intentionally now than ever. It's sort of like how our spaces have the potential to be um, community spaces in like even more important ways as right. like sort of spaces for organization and for tools for resistance and mm -hmm. uh, you know for education about in an era where like it's hard to know what to believe and how how did this come how did we get here all of right. that stuff um, so I think it starts with the buyer that's mm -hmm. that's Rebecca like she's looking at the list and she's ordering the most important new books but she's also looking at the back list and being like what are those things that I need to bring back up into the front of the conversation because people might have forgotten about it or they might not have discovered it yet right. and then the managers and the booksellers are thinking about that too and they're like you know what I think we need we need to like put these books out front and center. We need a mm -hmm. theme display on this issue. So it's it that all of the staff is very engaged. Mm -hmm. It starts with, you know, what Rebecca's doing with curating the inventory on the tables, I'm doing with curating the events. Mm -hmm. And all of our managers and all of our staff are really invested in that project. Right. So and and because we're independent, we can turn on a dime. We don't have to wait for like approval from corporate. We're That's just like true. we're doing this now today and and going from there. So. What's the big thing you guys have coming up next? Um, can I talk about Juno Diaz? Tell me ah! about Juno Diaz. That's what <laughs> so, I wanted. Right. So as you were saying, we do a lot of partnerships with other um, institutions because they have bigger spaces. So, you know, we can do great literary events in our store. They're anywhere from like 20 people to like maybe 100 people. Any bigger than that, we need a bigger space. So we work with St. Joseph's College. We work with the Brooklyn Academy of Music, with King's Theater on really big ones like ta Coates. And we've just started working more with the Brooklyn Public Library. Mm -hmm. So in March, we are hosting the launch of Juno Diaz's debut picture book. Yes. So he, you know, everyone knows and loves him, Drown, mm -hmm. uh, all of his amazing books that like, are, I'm not gonna be able to think of all the titles of them right now, but, um, um, but this is the first time he's ever done a book for kids. And it's something he's been working on for a really long time. It started with a conversation with a young relative who I think is now an adult. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about a girl whose family is from the island and she has a school assignment to draw a picture of the place where she's from. And she's like, I don't have any memories of that. I left when I was too little. So she talks to all of the people in her family and in her neighborhood about what they remember. So, I mean, it's obviously like, I have goosebumps talking about it. It's a beautiful, wonderful book, but especially in Brooklyn, like the place where she lives is not explicitly Brooklyn. It could be New Jersey, it could mm -hmm. be somewhere like but, but it's an urban place that's a city of immigrants, which is right. where we are. So we're doing this big event for families at the Brooklyn Public Library on March 13th. We're also taking Juno to a couple of schools mm -hmm. in neighborhoods where like this is going to be really relevant for them because this is their world. This is their identity. Um, he, Juno gave a great speech at Winter Institute, this recent conference, about mm -hmm how much kids need to be able to see themselves in stories. Yes. And that's a thing that all of us in the book world are talking about a lot lately. And this yes. is one of those books, like a lot of kids are gonna see themselves in this story. Fantastic. Yeah. Jessica, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll be able to have you back soon. Awesome, thanks Ashley. February 7th is National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. This year's theme, 
stay the course, the fight is not over. To tell us about that fight and how we can lower rates of contraction, Brooklyn's being the highest in the city, mind you, Brian Vines was joined last week by two members of the Alliance for Positive Change, Brandon Lee and Christian Paula. Here's that conversation. So the Alliance for Positive Change, you guys have the budget and you have the will, but I'm looking at these numbers from the CDC saying that compared to other races, African Americans account for a higher proportion of new HIV diagnosis. What's the disconnect? The disconnect for me, it comes to people in the African American and Latino community, well, I'm speaking from the eye and what I've experienced so far, is that they don't get tested as much. They usually use the word like, clean or dirty, it's like, are you clean? They assume when they say clean is negative, no syphilis, no gonorrhea, no nothing. Right. And when people think clean, they also think in uh, either HIV or syphilis. And when people go to the doctor, they don't get checked for HIV because they don't think they have it. Uh, or it will even be a uh, expectation for them to ever get it. So Christian, I'm looking at you now. Is this something that falls on the public health community or there's always this push and pull between public health and personal responsibility? It falls on everybody. Mm -hmm. it, falls, um, it falls on us as public health uh, um, workers to keep pushing it onto people. Like, just because you go to the doctor, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna t test for HIV when you're, when you're there. We try to advocate for more of taking tests more regularly rather than every year, right. try to, to get tested every four every four times a year. All of the baggage around stigma and dealing with HIV in all communities and particularly how it's in communities of color and this whole notion of clean. We're still here, we haven't wiped this away. It's still very much so an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have the technology and the medication that's keeping us alive greatly. Uh, people with HIV, you know, we hear now that people with HIV can live just as long as anybody else. And it's very much true. So. It's starting to become a bit of a, I guess, an apathy, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, I, HIV, I, I don't want it, but if I get it, well, what most you can do. So usually when people come to us right. for testing and Hep C testing, what we do is that we go over their sexual history. It's not so much shaming, is that to get to root of each person's individual risk mm -hmm. of getting HIV. So Christian, listening to this screening process and helping people come to accurate realizations about what their actual practices are. That takes a lot of individualized attention. What kind of services do you guys provide that service the whole person and not just that narrow part of the testing and the sexual being? Mm -hmm. So uh, once people get tested or come through the door for any, uh, number, any number of reasons, for those that qualify, we provide them for, with uh, free meals, counseling, support groups, yeah. and we also have a peer training institute uh, an education cycle for people who want to lead lives that are more self-sufficient. Yeah. So we are looking at the 7th, which is coming up, which is an important day for you guys. Clue us in as to what's happening on February 7th. It is Black AIDS Awareness Day. Say it again. Black AIDS Awareness <laughs> Day, very much so, right in the beginning of Black History Month. Mm -hmm. It's very much so to have us be aware that we are still being affected by this virus. So let's take care of our people who are affected, remember those who were affected, and right now take care of each other to make sure we stay on top of this epidemic so it can reduce our numbers. Because right now, 43% of us, yeah. black people, we're the ones getting HIV for new, um, for new, what is it, new, newly diagnosed. Yeah. And 33% of that is Latino people. And black and Latino, that's, that's already like 70%. But we need more awareness for that. Well, as we sit here in Brooklyn, we know that we have a dubious distinction of having some of the highest rates of new diagnoses and folks living with HIV and AIDS, particularly people of color. Are people not staying in care or doing enough preventative actions? Why do you think we have this bad number here? It could be any number of reasons, frankly, uh, because the New York City Department of Health has been trying to get the word out with the subway ads and the uh, ads all over the buses. The next step from there is making sure that those people are then not only seeing them, but then how also having conversations with their doctors. Because at the moment, the only way that you can get on PrEP is through a prescription through your doctor. So break down PrEP for us, for those who don't sure. know, pre-exposure, prophylactics. Pro the thing about that is that it seems also overwhelming in the yeah. sense of information, like information bomb. I like to break it down much easier for people. Hmm. 
So PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactic, they got the little R on it. Um, what it pretty much is, is imagine birth control. You wake up every day, you take your birth control, what well, comes for women. Um, but this, instead of stopping uh, unplanned pregnancy, stopping HIV. Take that medication and give it to people before they're infected and hey, no one's gonna be able to get infected. So this is the drug that we have been waiting for, right. but there's probably half the people on apps lying that they're on it and just doing other things. So <laughs> that's a whole, okay. So that's the issue in itself there. Um, because when it comes to straight people, yeah. for those who have heard of PrEP, mm -hmm. they think it's a gay pill. Yeah. They see like, oh, look at those two guys. Why, why would I, why that have to do with me? Um, and people who hear about people, you know, gay, LGBT, right. they're like, well, also I'm clean, and if I am going to take a pill every day, I, I'm, that's just the same as being positive. And they don't see that as a, this is a way to protect you from becoming positive. Mm -hmm. And they refuse to, some people just like, I don't want to take a pill if I'm not positive. It defeats the purpose. So Christian, AIDS has gone from being a death sentence to being a chronic manageable condition. Correct. How have we shifted our thinking as a society and in the segment that's most affected when I'm talking about people along the LGBT spectrum? Like how have we made our behaviors fit that actual shift in technology? Uh, one of them is through uh, more getting tested to be, testing to be much more accessible for people, meaning that it's free uh, through uh, through uh, agencies that provide them for free and get waivers, or it's at a low cost, we can get the test for a reduced cost at pharmacies uh, that sell them. Here in our last 30 seconds, I know you guys, there's something special on the 14th. So Have a Heart is a program that we're conducting over at, uh, at the Washington Heights location mm -hmm. at CASA. It's gonna be a health promotion day uh, with games and shows uh, of all sorts. Even though the 7th is Black AIDS Awareness Day, we're not gonna just stop the 7th. Right. Once it's 8th, we're not done. Mm -hmm. So it's good to keep up that awareness. Well, I thank you both for being here from the Alliance for Positive Change. We'll see you on the 7th and the 14th. Damn it. Applications for BRIC's Media Share grant project are open as of February 5th. The grants have helped numerous local organizations better message the important work they do. In 2014, one of these grantees was nominated for a New York Emmy for its PSA, Does Your Hotel Know the Signs of Sex Trafficking? Today we have with us two other previous grantees to tell us about their work. Sonia Shields from Brooklyn Community Services, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And Bahij Chansey from Green City Force. Welcome to 112BK, both of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia, can we start with you? Can you tell me just what you do? I'm the Chief Officer for External Relations and Advancement, long title. Ooh. I basically run the fundraising, marketing and communications, and the community, community education and outreach division at BCS. And what does BCS do? Brooklyn Community Services has been around for 151 years, and we serve poor and low-income residents in Brooklyn out of 30 different sites. Wow. We um, touch over 18,000 people a year. Wow. Bahij? Yes, I'm the Development and Communications Manager at Green City Force. Mm -hmm. And Green City Force has been around since 2009. We're a workforce development organization that runs an AmeriCorps program partnering with the New York City Housing Authority, otherwise known as NYCHA, where we train 18 to 24 year old NYCHA residents for jobs in the green economy. This sounds amazing. First of all, I was in AmeriCorps when I was in college, and I loved it. So. I didn't get to service. do anything as cool as this. But I got to do a lot of things that actually sort of ignited a love of um, nonprofit work in me, which is part of the reason why I'm here at Brick, because I love a nonprofit. How did you both end up getting involved with MediaShare, or how did your organization get involved with MediaShare? We've been partnering with um, Brick on a, a number of different projects, and um, someone in my department um, brought it to my attention and thought that we should apply, and mm -hmm. um, it was just, uh, and it was amazing when we heard that it was going to happen, to actually have that kind of resource, mm -hmm. you know, and to partner in that way. We worked on a number of sizzle reels um, mm -hmm. to to launch a campaign called the One Brooklyn Community Campaign, awesome. and uh, that was amazing. And then we also did a piece to kick off our 150th anniversary gala as well. Wow. So our seven minute video, and it was phenomenal. It was a wonderful experience. Sounds phenomenal. Yeah. Bahish, how about you? So 
Thankfully, Brick actually reached out to Green City Force to be included Excellent. in the 2017 cohort of the Media Share grantees. Mm -hmm. We were extremely happy to take the offer and apply. Um, what it did for us that was really amazing was we have some opportunities to get our organization's message out and our work out through the press, through the media. But what we don't usually have the chance to do is kind of tell that story from our own voice and right. from the voice of our program participants in particular, these young NYCHA residents who we serve and who help serve the community. And so to be able to have their voice be the real narrators of the story was something unique and something that helps tell the story in a way that other media sources just can't. What'd you make? So we made a short uh, type of PSA, kind of an info video about our Urban Farm Corps, mm -hmm. which runs a project called Farms at NYCHA. We have six urban farms, large scale, one to two acre farms at NYCHA developments around the city, which all together in 2017 distributed over 20,000 pounds of food to NYCHA oh, residents. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so you both made really awesome things. And I think we have clips from both of oh, them. Cool. And we're going to show cool. those here on the show. Cool. That's great. When I hear one Brooklyn community, what I think about is the ideal that Brooklyn is. Green City Force is an AmeriCorps program. And we recruit NYCHA residents ages 18 24. We uh, get them into service in NYCHA communities. And the last question that I want to get into here is what has been the impact on your organization from being involved in media shares and being able to create these things and work on that messaging? Yeah, sure. It, it just sort of took our, um, our understanding of the importance of video content to another level, mm. you know. Um, after that experience, we just, you know, we sort of, you know, made a commitment that that was going to be a big way in which we were going to share the stories of our clients. Um, we always do sort of a recap of all of our different activities and events. We often launch events in that way. Um, it's just really how we've been communicating because I feel like in general people are so busy mm -hmm. and it enables you to kind of cut through all of the clutter when you have good video content. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been a big way that in which we've been using, you know, it's been a, been a big part of our communication platform in general. How about City Green Force? Yeah, Green City Force. Um, Green City Force. It's why did I, quite I, all right. Why did I say anything else? You know, okay. people mix it up quite a Green bit. Green City Force. But uh, like BCS, we have a ton of different programming going on, and sometimes it can be a challenge to kind of concisely describe yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. video is one really fantastic tool to get that message across really succinctly in a way that a lot of people can grasp. Yeah. yeah, totally. Can you both tell me really quickly, starting with Sonia, the websites for people who want to check out your organizations a little bit more? We are BCS, so it's actually spelled out W-E-A-R-E-B-C-S dot org. Fantastic. And you can visit greencityforce.org, and I encourage 18 to 24-year-old NYCHA residents to visit there and look at our application if you're interested in the AmeriCorps program. Fantastic. Thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Hope to have you back on soon to talk about some more of the interesting things that you guys are doing. That'd be Thank great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us today. Tomorrow we'll be back to talk about New York's new zero waste guidelines, a conversation with the great-great-grandson of Frederick Douglass, and some Brooklyn-based jazz. Hope you can join us.